Okay, it says that we are on the air. So, hello everyone, and welcome to our second annual uh, Shakespeare's birthday live stream from Special Collections and Professor Adam Hooks. Um, I, my name is Colleen Tyson, and uh, I'm the Outreach and Instruction Librarian in Special Collections here at the University of Iowa. So I will be a moderator for today's live event. Um, if you have questions, um, the goal of today is to ask questions. Um, I'll introduce you or let you introduce yourself in just a moment. Um, logistics first. Uh, we're here to answer questions today, and the way to do that is to type it into the live stream, um, or you can type it on Twitter using our hashtag ShakesLive, S-H-X-L-I-V-E. Uh, so go ahead and type your questions on Twitter, or oh, that's the delay. So we are definitely live uh, with a slight delay. So type your questions on Twitter or type them right here on the YouTube channel live stream and uh, we'll get all of your questions answered today. Um, moving right along, uh, today's featured Shakespeare scholar is Professor Adam Hooks. And do you want to say more of an introduction? Uh, I am Professor Adam Hooks. I teach in the English department here at the University of Iowa. I also teach courses at the University of Iowa Center for the Book, uh, the UICB. Uh, I work on Shakespeare and rare books, and I'm here to answer questions about both of those things. Uh, some of the things that we'll take a look at today, you can see at my website, adamghooks.net, um, and you can also see a whole bunch of other books from our special collections that we won't be talking about today. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, the site's full of great content. Uh, and you can see the link in the description for today's event as well. Um, so you can go there if, today or later uh, to read more. So we have taken a few questions so far. Um, did you want to start with a question or a book? Uh, I want to start with the book before we get to the questions, just because. Uh, I love starting with books. <laughs> this would be this would be a lot more fun. This is a surprise that Colleen brought uh, for us. It is from 1965, uh, a joint edition of Romeo and Juliet and West Side Story. Uh, which is based on Romeo and Juliet, obviously. Um, and the reason I wanted to start with this is that uh, I used a book very much exactly like this uh, when I was in college taking a course on Shakespearean adaptations. Uh, and so I thought it was just fun to bring out. This is obviously an older one. I'm not quite that old. Um, <laughs> well, it seems like a good place to start too because so many people get their start with Shakespeare through adaptations. I know one of the first introductions I had to Romeo and Juliet was West Side Story. So. Um, it's an avenue that people discover Shakespeare through. Uh, a lot of Shakespeareans get tired of Romeo and Juliet. A lot of students uh, show up at college tired of Romeo and Juliet because everyone read it in high school, uh, which is why I love to teach Romeo and Juliet and almost always do because I want to rescue this play <laughs> uh, from high school English classes that have ruined it for generations uh, of students. I also teach a lot of education majors and they'll be going out into the world uh, teaching the play as well. And so I want to extend the reach of this particular play and show that there's a lot more going on. Um, also, hashtag Team Juliet. <laughs> All right, we have two hashtags now. <laughs> Shakes Live, which you can use to ask your questions, S-H-X-L-I-V-E, uh, for today's live stream, or type them in the, in the YouTube channel, or Team Juliet. Use it. <laughs> right. So we're just checking the feeds now. Um, we did have a few questions come in already on Twitter. So I'm going to go ahead and talk for a second about uh, our question from the first question from uh, Sarah Werner at the Folger Shakespeare Library, AKA Winken himself. Uh, what is our favorite copy and least favorite copy of Shakespeare? Which is a really interesting question uh, and one that I'm sure I could give many different answers uh, to either one of those. Um, I've, I've actually thought about this before. Um, 
so I'll, I will give, I'll say, well, one of the most important, especially since um, this is coming from the Folger Shakespeare Library itself, AKA the happiest place in North America for <laughs> Shakespeare scholar. Um, I did my uh, master's degree in Washington, DC, and I took the master's seminar at the Folger. And the book that I chose for my semester project was a 1655 edition of The Rape of Lucrece, um, uh, which, which was accompanied by a continuation poem written by a royalist poet named John Quarles, a really bad poet, frankly, um, son of the famous emblematist um, Francis Quarles. Uh, it was just a really interesting volume. Uh, it was one of the first times, it was the first time that uh, The Rape of Lucrece was published in this particular manner. Although the, the interesting thing is that that particular poem has gone through a lot of uh, kind of editorial um, additions in the early 17th century. Starting in, I think, 1624, is split up into sections, uh, given uh, a new title. And so there was, a, there was a history of doing things to this poem. Uh, the interesting thing from my perspective was that Lucrece is often thought to be a Republican uh, poem, and here it is being published um, under a royalist banner, trying to recuperate Shakespeare uh, for the royalist cause with some you know, really bad rhyming couplets uh, as well. Um, but the nice thing about the Folger is that they had not only a single copy of this particular volume, they had multiple copies, there was a nice frontispiece engraving, they had separate copies of those as well. Uh, so there's a lot of fun stuff to play with. So that was one of the first, uh, it may it may not be my favorite necessarily, but it was the first one that I got to play around with, and so it's always held a special place for me. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite copy? I think favorite copies for me tend to be the ones that are mine. You know, the one that I studied from, the one that I performed from, the one that I marked up, you know, writing in it. <laughs> in, in all those ways. So I would say my copy of A Midsummer Night's Dream from when I directed the show is my favorite because it has all of my stage notes for all of my, my actors, my friends. Cool. Mm -hmm. There is a copy of the uh, uh, first edition of the Norton Shakespeare somewhere with um, all of my undergraduate marginalia in pen. <laughs> um, I always advocate to my students to mark up their books, even when they come from the library, um, but you might not want to do it in pen. Uh, and not to library books. It's different when it's your own copy. That's my copy. I'm not going to give that back to a library. I keep that forever. I give you the look of shame. <laughs> it's not the first time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you want to uh, talk about least favorite copy? Oh, least favorite copy. That's a difficult one. Um, I, can, I, can, I can think about that in a couple ways. The first one I won't name, but there are um, critical editions that I really love, and there are critical editions that I really don't love, and I don't think it would be very nice to talk about the ones that I, I don't love, um, but they do exist, uh, I will tell you that. Um, we've been, I've been talking a lot with my students this semester about the character of different editions because we're, I'm teaching a class where we're reading Three Hamlets and Two Lears, and we spend a lot of time with the Arden editions, and we get to know the editor very intimately. Uh, and we, get, and we argue with the editors uh, a lot about particular decisions or interpretations or explanatory notes, uh, which is a good thing to do. I always like to argue with the footnotes and argue with the, with the editors. So there, there are some out there that I like a lot less than others. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say that my least favorite copy of Shakespeare is one that I've never seen in person and probably never will see, see in person, and that's the um, Folger copy number one of the first folio, which Mr. Folger spent a lot of time, effort, and money to acquire because it, when it was found in the early 20th century, uh, it was thought to be um, the closest uh, that a first folio would come to being 
fresh out of the print shop. It's mm-hmm. the largest, I think it's the largest copy, um, the least trimmed copy that we have. And so it's it's like the fetishized object that I spend so much of my time uh, thinking about, writing about, writing against, complaining about loudly, annoyingly. Uh, so that that might be my least favorite copy. I, I don't really want to see it either. And it's enough that it exists. Tantalizingly <laughs> out of reach. Oh. Well, uh, just to sum up, uh, you, if you're just tuning in, uh, this is our Shakespeare live stream in or in honor of Shakespeare's birthday week and uh, we're answering questions live on air. Uh, we have some beautiful and interesting editions uh, from special collections here at the University of Iowa to show off in these two hours. Uh, and we're happy to answer questions. Uh, Professor Hooks is on hand here to answer your questions. Just type them into the YouTube description, uh, the comment section, or you can tweet at us uh, using the hashtag sh- ShakesLive, S-H-X-L-I-V-E. And uh, we do have a question on our YouTube. Um, oh, if I could bring it back up. It was about one of the sonnets. Mm, it doesn't like all these streams running at once. If we're going to talk about the sonnets, I'm going to grab another book for a second. That's a great idea. While I bring it up. Uh, talking about those early Lucreces reminded me of this. Um, this is a really pretty book. I normally don't go for pretty books, I like <laughs> the messy, marked up ones. But this one's a pretty nice, pretty book. This is the Kelmscott Press, uh, or no, is, yeah, the Kelmscott Press edition. Uh, of Shakespeare's poems. And this is what we got the webcam for this year. So let's test this out and see if we can get you some close-up shots Uh, of this book that we're taking a look at. A camera that moves, people. This is how dedicated we are. Technology. Uh, We're going to test this, but it's probably going to get a little shaky for a minute, so bear with us. All right, you ready? ready? Traveling. And here we go. As it adjusts, how's that? So, can you describe what it is that you're taking a look at for our viewers? Oh, there, there we go. it is. Uh, if you've if, if you've ever seen any uh, Kelmscott Press or William Morris books, which is fine press books, this should look really familiar. This is a really um, uh, beautiful book, and they chose in part to print Shakespeare's poems um, because this is a canonical, important piece of literature. And this is something that uh, that they did uh, more famously with books that were not Shakespeare. Um, but this is just if you're a typography nerd. Um, soak this up because this is really I'm gonna see what our camera can do I'm gonna test a close-up how's it doing is it reversing it interesting interesting If it is actually, it's reversed for us. I don't know if it's reversed for everyone, but even if it is. They can let us know in the comments. Yeah. And actually, I don't think it really matters um, because this is not exactly um, a copy of the book that you would want to sit down next to the the fireplace and uh, read from, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, The visual 
the striking um, uh, visual style here is the more important thing. Yeah, and come Scott, William Morris, of course, coming at the late 19th century and hearkening back to uh, really make finely made books with really fine materials, um, to make extremely beautiful books at a time when books were um, made on pulp paper, you know, made of poor quality materials. All right, I'm gonna head back to the larger view unless you've got something you wanna show. No, I don't need to show anything else. Um, I will say that, that one of the reasons that I was interested in, in this book, um, for two reasons, one is that I pull this out for classes every now and then because we have a really nice collection of fine press books, and so it's really nice to show the students uh, different examples of Shakespeare from multiple centuries. The other reason uh, is that there's a little note in the front of this book that states, after a lapse of about 300 years, Shakespeare's poems are in this edition with the original spelling. Uh, that the orthography of an author of the 16th or 17th century cannot, without detriment, be translated into that of the 19th seems a proposition too evident to leave room for controversy. The fact of being able to study these poems in the language in which they were written ought, we think, to add materially to the pleasure of the reader. Uh, I've actually written online about this particular edition, and I'll send a link out on Twitter in just a second. Uh, but I just want to say a couple things about this, and one is that this is a pretty common sentiment uh, from uh, the 19th and early 20th century about recovering um, uh, Shakespeare's language, uh, recovering the English language in an earlier form that hasn't been modernized, that hasn't been uh, altered by editors in a lot of ways. Uh, the other interesting thing is this claim uh, to do this for the first time in 300 years. Uh, since Shakespeare's time, uh, which I did a little digging around and is kind of technically true, mostly. Uh, uh, the, the narrative poems and the sonnets were never properly integrated into the Shakespeare canon, into editions of the complete works in the 18th century. That's, um, that's also a claim that, that you can quibble with. Um, for a lot of different reasons, but Edmund Malone in the 19th century was the first one who was really uh, aiming to integrate the poems, but he only had a copy of the fourth quarto of Venus and Adonis. Um, he eventually did acquire uh, a copy, the sole surviving copy, I believe, of Q1 Venus and Adonis and complained about how much money it cost. Um, but he unfortunately died before he could properly edit that text. And so to, and to some degree, I suppose, there's a, um, uh, this particular edition has some claim to that, although it's certainly not an edition intended um, to, um, that was intended to be bibliographically sound. It's supposed to be pretty, and it is pretty. And if you're interested in that, or want to see pictures that aren't backwards, maybe. Uh, we have officially confirmed that it's just back, backwards on our screen. Oh, um, cool. And the view that sort of the Google YouTube is showing us, but um, looks great. And they said they could see the close-ups really well. So thanks for bearing with us as we test the, the bumpy move over to close-up view, but it's good that we're able to show multiple views this year. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, one other question that we've got here on the YouTube channel, if that's something you want to tackle. Um, homework uh, help. Sonnet 130. So we've got we that one. I can show you Sonnet 130 in this very pretty book. Um, Yeah, multimedia. Yeah, now we're getting our picture taken. Live, Sweet. and now you'll see the picture. And you saw us get the picture taken. The magic of the internet. Okay, well, I'm checking. Oh yeah, Sonnet 130. Um, 
Uh, do I have anything interesting to say about Sonnet 130? <laughs> Not particularly. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I will say that there is um, a very nice Sonnet app for the iPad uh, that has a lot of useful information and facsimiles and also videos of famous people reading the sonnets. And those videos are also freely available online. And if memory serves correct, I think Stephen Fry might be the one who reads Sonnet 130. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to compete with that. Uh, I would also urge you to ask a librarian um, for your homework assignment. And uh, I know that they'll help you pull up some inter interesting offline information from databases and from all the research that's out there that will help you with your project. Actually, can, do, can, we, can we do the little flip around? Yeah, Again, this absolutely. Would be fun. I was just talking about the original spelling uh, in this edition of the sonnets. And this is actually a pretty good. Uh, 130? Yeah. All right. A really good example uh, of this, such as the, the spelling of wires here. Hairs be wires, black wires grow on the head. Uh, you can see a couple of more examples. I grant I never saw a goddess go. So there are a few little um, noticeable differences between this and a modern edition, including the spelling of coral in the second line there. Curl is far more red than her lips red. Uh, a couple of other quick things about the sonnets. Uh, I'm not gonna I won't give you homework for you, but uh, I'll say a couple of things about the sonnets because I, I don't normally get to, I don't normally spend tons of time teaching them, although I've written some stuff about the, the Passionate Pilgrim that I think we mentioned last year on the live stream. Uh, the, the first thing is that the, the sonnets are numbered, but they're not necessarily a sequence. Uh, they're often called a sonnet sequence, but they're not necessarily one. Um, there's been a lot written about that lately. You can think of them more as um, trying to remember exactly which word I should use. Somewhat of a miscellany, perhaps, maybe. There are certainly groupings of sonnets that you can make interpretive connections among. So uh, my advice to present on Sonnet 130 would be to read Sonnet 129 and 131 and 132 and 133. <laughs> and uh, then keep going until, until you've finished. <laughs> Well, for those of you just tuning in, uh, we'll give the reminder that this is our uh, Shakespeare's birthday live stream with the University of Iowa Special Collections and Professor Adam Hooks. Um, we're showing off some interesting editions of Shakespeare and, and uh, answering your questions today. So if you ha do have questions, um, you can go ahead and type them in the YouTube channel or uh, type them on YouTube using the hashtag ShakesLive, S-H-X-L-I-V-E. Um, and now I'm going to adjust the camera because we're sort of getting only heads. The one disadvantage to having a movable camera. There, that's a little more stable. Perhaps not. Mobile Shakespearean. Mm -hmm. I did get a, a, a question about uh, the funniest or most critically productive textual crux in Shakespeare, uh, a textual crux uh, is a textual problem uh, that editors and scholars have to grapple with uh, when there's no clear or easy solution. Um, I'll just say that the, the one that all uh, Shakespeareans, whether they're textual scholars or not, end up confronting, uh, it's one of the most famous ones in Shakespeare, so famous that it's almost boring to a certain degree. Um, is is in Othello uh, in his final speech when he compares himself uh, to the base Indian or uh, the base Judean, depending on whether you're reading the folio text or the quarto text. And the reason that this is uh, it's a, it's obviously important interpretively, um, considering the play's focus on religion which is one of the, the reasons that I teach the play all the time. Um, the, the reason it's also 
fun is that it's pretty easily understandable once you explain how this error might have happened in the print shop because there were no J's, so I's are J's. Um, so it could be Indian or Judean. And when I tell my students to imagine a piece of type that is the letter N that's accidentally flipped upside down so that it looks like a U, and there are these moments that happen uh, in the classroom, which is just fun. Mm -hmm. um, again and again and again, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we do have a question too on our YouTube channel um, from Mitch Frost, uh, Mitch Thompson. Sorry. Um, since Shakespeare invented so many words, how would one of that age know what the word meant? Context. Oh, that is a really intriguing uh, twist on uh, the question. Uh, th the first thing I'll say is that Shakespeare did. Uh, invent lots of words, but not nearly as many uh, as is often thought. Um, if you want a really good explanation for why that's so, uh, I believe Holger Syme has a very nice blog post laying out uh, why this is wrong. Um, Shakespeare actually, Shakespeare had a, a very fine vocabulary, but perhaps not even as big as some of his contemporaries. Um, the, one of the reasons that we think he invented so many words is that when the Oxford English Dictionary was being constructed, this is a pretty well-known story, they, they go to canonical authors for their examples. And so obviously Shakespeare is going to be overrepresented there. Um, with the digital databases uh, and linguistic and computer analysis, uh, we can do a lot more detailed work on vocabulary than we used to be able to. And in fact, one of the reasons that Shakespeare's plays tend to be more popular now is, is not so much about the vocabulary, it's, it, it's the way that he uses words um, rather than the words themselves. Um, my, my favorite example that I, I love to use comes from uh, Ben Johnson, who loved to make fun of his theatrical contemporaries, especially other playwrights, and includes a figure that's supposed to represent uh, jo the playwright John Marston, who is famous for for his neologisms, uh, and Johnson in Poet Aster makes him throw up uh, examples of words taken from Marston's plays. Uh, so neologism is not always a good thing. The more interesting um, element of this question is how did people know what the words meant at the time? Uh, context certainly is part of it. Uh, remember that these are plays being performed as well, so there is um, the theatrical context uh, to help explain things. I'll, although I will also say that you don't always need to know exactly what every single word says. And I've been spending a lot of time in my class on King Lear. And we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about the sound of the words in King Lear. Um, uh, the, the, it, it is more about the, no, the sound or the noise, the cacophony, um, uh, of the language rather than the content itself. Um, you, can, you can see this really clearly in the third act when you have uh, the, the, the mad Lear in the storm with the fool, with Edgar pretending to be poor Tom, speaking a bunch of nonsense that the poor Arden editor uh, could, couldn't explain uh, because it is mostly nonsense to a certain degree. Uh, so it, it, it is about creating this environment of chaos on stage. Uh, so it really is about the sound of the words. Um, uh, or Lear invoking, kind of conjuring up the storm himself uh, through the words, uh, the, re the repeated syllables in that play, nothing, never. Uh, so that's a, it's more about that. So in some sense, the um, Shakespeare's writing uh, not only to be comprehended, or writing not only to be, to be read, um, but like almost writing a score for the actors to, to perform, almost like musicians, using their bodies in the theater as an instrument. Shout out to Bruce R. Smith, who was my master's advisor, so. Well, the way you describe it, it also makes me think of Dr. Seuss, you know, with a focus on the sound and made up words throughout. Um, and yeah, it's, you sort of get what the made-up words are, are aiming at, but also it's not really important what they mean because it's about the, the sound patterns. 
I don't know if that's a useful just comparison, but that's what it, it makes me think of is because yeah, I don't know. Oh no, oh no. I don't know. Again, the disadvantages of we, we learn the advantages and the disadvantages of the different pieces of technology. The disadvantage of the detached webcam is its uh <laughs> Instability. All right, try that again. Um, I feel like this, though. I mean, I did. I'm the one who brought up King Lear. Disorders, storm, unnatural chaos. All right, we are set and stable. You know, since I'm going to pull out another example here, um, since we're talking about King Lear and the the little the little one next to the gym, uh, this one? No, that, this one. Yeah. Awesome. There we go. So this is a fun one. Uh, as I said, I've been teaching a lot of King Lear, and one of the sources uh, that Shakespeare used to write, wait, is this the right one? Oh, um, no, shoot, it's not the right one. We have just one follow-up to the words and phrases um, topic before sure. we completely pass it by. Um, and that's just, did you have any favorite word or phrase that Shakespeare coined? You said that there weren't as many as people think. Um, and, and maybe you don't have one off the top of your head. But if you do have a favorite Shakespearean coined Shakespearean, oh my gosh, I word have or phrase. no idea. Um, Let's see. That's that one's got me totally and utterly stumped. I have to say, Christina Jensen, you have stumped the panel. Yeah, it's also because I've never quite thought of it that way. And mm -hmm. in fact, we all have favorite lines and maybe least favorite lines in Shakespeare, uh, or lines that we are particularly attracted to, um, or lines that are, that sound awkward. In a lot of ways, uh, but I don't have a particular. I don't think of it as um, the the words that he coined necessarily. I, I engage with the text in in a very different way. Um, Sarah Werner has suggested incarnadine. Oh, Incarnadine, that's a really good one. <laughs> um, uh, one that I was just acquainted with recently because uh, last semester in my Shakespeare class, for the first time ever, I relented and taught Macbeth, um, which it turns out it's pretty good. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> always illuminating to see it through the eyes of students. Exactly. It brings new things to it every yeah. time. Every time. The, uh, uh, before we leave the, the language bit, um, the other thing I would say is that um, uh, there's been a lot of work on dictionaries, Shakespearean dictionaries, mm. recently. Um, and here's where I, I point everyone to uh, Andrew Keener's blog, the PhD student at Northwestern who works on uh, language and, and, and the dictionaries. Uh, I think we also talked last year when we did this about the Shakespeare's Beehive, the copy of the, the dictionary that the booksellers are claiming uh, was owned by Shakespeare, but it, but it really wasn't. Um, so, that, I mean, a different way to think about questions like this is that there were a lot of resources available for learning language and for thinking about language at the time. Uh, and so you could possibly go to a dictionary um, uh, as one way to do this. Uh, the, the other thing is that people didn't necessarily read Shakespeare in exactly the same way. They did read Chaucer in this way. Uh, in 1598, in Thomas Spate's uh, edition of Chaucer, he includes uh, an appendix of hard words um, to help people uh, who are unfamiliar with Chaucer's archaic language. Um, and I, I was showing my class that the other day because we had a nice copy of it that's annotated and in a lot of interesting ways, which I will link to some pictures if you want to, uh, if people out there want to take a look at that. So, yeah, which I will do in just a second. But first, 
We uh, we do have more questions, but I think you were feeling like it's time for another book. Just what? Just another book. Just really quick. Yeah. Um, okay, we're gonna try the webcam again. I, <laughs> Bear with us; it'll be a little shaky as I try to move it. I was talking oh. about um, King Lear, uh, and one of the sources that Shakespeare used for King Lear, and we know that he had uh, a copy uh, or read a copy, is Samuel Harznitz. A Declaration of Egregious Popish Impostures, one of the better titles of a Shakespearean source, I have to say. And as far as religious treatises go, a pretty entertaining read. Uh, kind of, um, uh, I'll give it an overly simplistic example, but, or a description of this, but kind of an expose of um, Catholic priests who were performing exorcisms. Um, the new historicists loved to write about this because it casts uh, performance in a very interesting light. Uh, Shakespeare famously took a bunch of names of devils from this book uh, that, that Edgar in guise as poor Tom uh, uses in that play. So there are a lot of you know, flippity gibbet and things like that uh, that he takes from this book. For the book nerds out there, the most interesting thing about our copy is the fact that it was damaged at some point Uh, and then repaired really beautifully um, by someone writing in uh, the, the leaves, the text on the leaves that had been lost. So you can see this really nice title page uh, that's designed here. And the table of contents at the beginning, the argument of the several chapters has been written in as well. Much later than the 17th century, I would add, this handwriting is much later. Um, although there, there is some marginalia in the early stages of the book that looks much earlier, possibly closer to, to not contemporary certainly, but not far off. Um, so the title page you would expect to be lost because if this was sold as an unbound book, uh, title pages often get lost, particularly of well-known books. Uh, they, they, they are either damaged or perhaps liberated from the volume once the book became well-known as a Shakespearean source. But the other interesting thing is that there are a couple leaves in the middle of the book that have also been replaced very carefully as well. So the trying to, at the top there, the, the running title, um, trying to mimic the typography. I recently showed this book to my classes and I was so interested in the ways that the book had been altered and repaired later uh, that I forgot to talk about <laughs> uh, its status as a source for the play that we've been <laughs> spending half the semester reading. So, Also a fantastic example of the library perforated stamp, uh, stamp around yeah. State University of Iowa. No Was one is taking this page. <laughs> the state. That's for sure. I'm just setting the camera back up. Then we'll see. I'll send out a link to our copy of the author as well that I've just mentioned. Just let me fiddle a little bit more, folks, and then I'll have this camera all set. Okay, good. All right, heading back to the hashtag on Twitter. Uh, if you've just recently tuned in, uh, the, you can ask your questions either on the YouTube page or by tweeting at us using using, <laughs> using the hashtag ShakesLive, S-H-X-L-I-V-E, uh, or type your questions into uh, the YouTube channel. Um, we do have uh, some questions coming in on our YouTube. Um, and just checking in on the hashtag, we seem to have gotten a lot of the questions that are over there on YouTube or on uh, Twitter. 
there is a question on YouTube asking about if you want to talk a little about the history of illustrated editions, engravings, or etchings, and their relationship or non-relationship to performance practice. Oh, wow. Uh, let's see. I'm not the right Shakespearean to ask about that, but I can point you to the right direction. No, um, so the, the, the um, I believe the first illustrated, illustrated edition um, when Shakespeare's works started being published uh, in the 18th century in multi-volume uh, editions, uh, starting with Nicholas Rowe in 1709. Each play had a nice uh, engraved frontispiece um, illustrating a scene from the play. Uh, and some of those were copied uh, throughout the century. And so it became somewhat common uh, for these editions to have uh, illustrations uh, as far as relation to performance practice, uh, some some illustrations in the 18th century, uh, I believe, did have some relationship to theatrical performance, but I couldn't tell you off the top of my head which ones exactly. Um, the my students were just looking at the ones in the row edition uh, a couple of weeks ago and comparing it uh, the 1709 row to the 1714 row, uh, which I think we have both copies here, uh, both sets here at Iowa. And they're in different formats, so the, the books are different sizes, so they've copied the engravings uh, to fit the smaller format. Uh, so there's some interesting copying and um, alterations to those as well. And we were, again, not to harp on King Lear, uh, but we were looking at that one, uh, illustrating, I think, a, a scene from the storm in a very naturalistic setting, which of course you would never have uh, on stage in the same way. So, But il illustrated Shakespeare is, is a huge field of study with a lot of material to work with, um, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and if you want to see lots of those kinds of illustrations, there are a lot of them online. Uh, the Folgers Luna database of digital images has a lot of those. Um, there are a lot, uh, a lot to be found elsewhere as well. The, actually, the, the, the other interesting thing, um, <laughs> this is what happens to my, this is when my students kind of sigh in class, like, oh gosh, you got really excited about something um, nerdy. Um, is that there are some illustrations of the stage not necessarily from, from Shakespeare, from the 17th century. And, and that is really interesting because it possibly gives us um, information about performance, but not necessarily. Uh, there's a famous manuscript drawing of a scene from Titus Andronicus that people still argue about whether or not it, it relates to performance. There are a lot of images um, on playbooks uh, that may or may not have some relation to the ways in which particular characters were costumed. Um, think of the famous Dr. Faustus woodcuts, but there are a lot of other examples uh, as well. Um, so there, so it, it is it is possible, and theater historians have written about the ways that uh, we may or may not be able to learn about the theater from contemporary illustrations. And then also, uh, people have written about the illustrations, those illustrations that did uh, occur on the title pages of some plays and, mm -hmm. and their relation to the play. So uh, so Claire uh, Bourne has written about the Beaumont and Fletcher quartos with illustrations on the title page, which have really interesting and interpretive significance um, uh, for, for, the, for the play. Or the Roaring Girl, in fact, because that's her Twitter handle, so go ask her uh, at Roaring Girl. Um, so that, yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting things to, to, to think about. Well, I had some questions. Sure. <laughs> I was just wondering if there were any, any plays that, I mean, because you teach a lot of undergraduates and a lot of times introduce them to these plays either for the first time or introduce them to the play in an academic setting for the first time. Are there any that seem to just work particularly well? It, for for teaching undergraduate students and are there any that there's barriers you know mm. 
And if so, what, what types of barriers are you seeing that have to sort of be worked through as undergraduates approach these plays? Mm. Multi-part. Yeah, no, this is a, <laughs> this is a, a really good question. Uh, and it's also about, it's as much about pedagogy as, the, as about the plays themselves. Um, I'll give, a, I'll give a few examples uh, because over the years I've actually shrunk the number of plays that I teach during the course of the semester so that we have extra, so we have more time to, to think about them uh, for all sorts of different reasons because it allows us to think about different conceptual or, or textual mm -hmm. issues um, or like the, the Romeo and Juliet West Side Story, it, it allows us to talk about adaptations and film and performance alongside the text. Um, so I, I very often teach Romeo and Juliet. Um, which is somewhat of a struggle because even the students who recognize that we've done something very different with the play and made them think about the play in a different way than, than they did in high school still end up not liking it. <laughs> uh, uh, so that, that can be a, a challenge. Um, any, any play that they read in, that, that is commonly taught in high school can be difficult to teach simply because they have preconceptions about it. That's one of the reasons why I never taught Macbeth before this year, because that's one that's uh, often taught in high school and, and a certain set of kind of thematic issues get crystallized in their minds. And it's difficult, it can be difficult to overcome that, but I like the challenge. Uh, Hamlet normally goes over pretty well, although everyone generally thinks that he is kind of whiny and mean to Ophelia. And both of those things are true, which makes it difficult to get beyond that as well, to, to some degree. Uh, the, ones that, that, uh, the one that uh, I've been teaching recently on a regular basis is Richard III, uh, which goes over really well because uh, Richard is great and he's attractive and he's um, wily and articulate and um, blunt. Um, and we just found his bones and it's always fun to talk about bones. So we spend a long time thinking about Richard III. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I teach Othello a lot um, for a number of reasons. I really like the play, it may be the most important Shakespeare play to teach, particularly with the uh, demographics that I often teach here in Iowa. So it allows us to talk about a lot of very sensitive issues um, of contemporary relevance, um, but with some distance from the actual text uh, that we're reading. And also allows us to talk about history of criticism and, and performance. And uh, I've really had some students undergraduate and graduate do some fantastic things with Othello. Um, people are really, seem to be really drawn to, to that play for a number of different reasons. Um, plays that are difficult to teach. Um, there's no shortage of those, that's for certain. Uh, I've been teaching uh, kind of paired classes, a Shakespeare class and a non-Shakespearean drama class. Uh, and some of the plays I pair together, and so I've done Merchant of Venice and the Jew of Malta and Marlowe's The Jew of Malta, and both of those are really difficult for quite obvious reasons. Um, again, both for undergraduates and for graduate students, and I, I have to think that um, Mer Merchant is not a play that I work on in my own scholarship. In fact, most of these plays that I teach, I, I don't work on specifically in my own scholarship and uh, Merchant is one that I, that I struggle with the most, which actually can make it more productive. Uh, I don't have, um, in that sense, it's more about shared discovery, which is how I, I always teach book history in my classes. But if they see uh, the professor also trying to struggle through and grapple with the text, uh, that, can be really, that can be really useful. I, I uh, I used to teach Pericles, but I haven't for a while. That one was kind of tough, but I really love it. So maybe I'll throw it back in the rotation. Pirates, textual issues, all sorts of fun things. Well, do you think it's time for another book? Yeah, let's look at let's take a take a look at another one. Any particular Favorite? Um, let's see here. Uh, 
yeah, this, this one's right here. So let's I have a couple that are kind of paired. Um, this is, again, I like to teach the history plays, but I haven't for a little while for various reasons. OK, here we go. So can you describe what we're looking at? We're or the We're looking internet. at um, a history book uh, that purports to give us the first part of the life and reign of King Henry the Fourth, extending to the end of the first year of his reign, written by I H, which is actually J H, which is actually John Hayward, uh, and it says down here at the bottom that it's printed by John Wolfe in 1599. A couple of interesting things to think about. This relates in part uh, to Shakespeare's um, collection of history plays on Richard II and on Henry IV, uh, parts one and part two. Most of this book actually details uh, the end of Richard II's reign, who was you know, notoriously thrown off the throne uh, and killed. Uh, and Henry IV took over, uh, and that is the story of English usurpation. So it's something that obviously had relevance uh, to Shakespeare's plays. Although um, the other thing is that this book, this particular book, uh, was censored uh, and was cited and was forbidden to be uh, published in 1599 for obvious reasons, uh, not wanting to expose readers to um, the overthrow of the monarchy. Uh, at the end of Elizabeth's reign, and, and Richard II uh, was sometimes, there's a, a bit of evidence to show that she may have been compared to Richard II in, in, some, in some ways. There are some um, famous stories that have come down to us uh, about that. So, and there, um, there's also some connection to the Essex Rebellion because Hayward uh, did the eminently uh, reasonable thing of dedicating this book to the Earl of Essex, which was also a, not a good thing to do. The reason that our copy is really interesting is that it says it was published in 1599, but I did some digging around, and it turns out this was actually uh, printed somewhere around like 1638. Much uh, later. Much, much later. There are multiple editions of this book, um, all of which have some discernible differences, including different ornaments on the title page. Uh, and there are also some editions uh, in which um, this word here has a flipped E, I believe. So uh, a printing error that was corrected. So there, there are certain bibliographical things that distinguish these editions. Uh, the interesting thing is that you can understand why you would do that for immediate reprints for a notorious book that was banned, because banning something always makes it more desirable. Uh, but that 40 years later, it was still being printed in the same way. It means that the, uh, the surreptitious imprint was part of the appeal of this particular book, um, which is fun and interesting in all sorts of different ways. Censorship. Sen is a difficult word to say. Censorship is something that my students are often very interested in, in Shakespeare classes and in book history classes for uh, kind of obvious reasons. Uh, we know that the systems of censorship uh, in the Elizabethan and Jacobean era were, and the Caroline era, thank you, Cindy Applied, for writing all three of those books for us, uh, was far more uh, scattered and chaotic than it's often thought to be. So it, it, it's a good lesson in, in Renaissance censorship as well. In fact, if we can, maybe I'll pair this really quickly with one more book um, that relates to this. I'll get this out of the way. All right. Uh, so I'm going to show you this. I want you to, everyone to see how nice and thin it is. Uh, we don't have any Shakespearean era play quartos in our collection, but we do have several uh, adaptations of Shakespeare plays and some other plays from the late 17th century uh, that are bound separately like this. So you get some idea, the students can get some idea 
of what an unbound pamphlet play quarto would have looked like, which is a really important thing um, to think about for all sorts of reasons. This particular copy, uh, which we'll show you in just a second, but I'll say something about first, is an adaptation of Shakespeare's Richard II uh, by Nahum Tate. This was published in 1681, uh, so late 17th century, in a very different political environment than Shakespeare's time, but still one that was connected in a lot of different ways. Uh, a, a lot of late 17th century adaptations of Shakespeare kind of invoked the authority of Shakespeare to authorize their play, uh, but also invoked Shakespeare uh, as a playwright who was long dead and, writ and wrote plays in a very different environment as a way uh, to, to cover their own political critiques. It's not me, it's just Shakespeare. Um, so Tate's play um, was very politically sensitive, uh, and it was forbidden from the stage. Um, he altered the play, uh, so instead of said instead of uh, using the character names from Shakespeare's Richard II, he moved the setting to Sicily and renamed the play the Sicilian Usurper, uh, and gave everything everyone Italian names that didn't work either. Uh, it was still forbidden from the stage, and so he published the book uh, with a lengthy preface uh, in justification of himself and of his play, um, d defending himself not only against accusations of, of political critique, but of messing around with Shakespeare as well. So th these prefaces are really interesting to read uh, because they are, in some sense, critical documents early critical documents uh, about Shakespeare, about his style, about the distance of half a century, um, historical uh, and linguistic as well. The language had changed, theatrical fashions had changed. Um, so this is a really nice, uh, really nice thing to have for our students. So, we need to look? show that yeah, one? Let's yeah. Take a look. yeah, let's take a close look. It, uh, it moves backwards, so I get a little mixed up. There we go. So you can see here the history of King Richard II um, acted under the name of the Sicilian usurper, a prefatory epistle in vindication of the author, occasioned by the prohibition of the play on the stage by N. Tate, uh, published down here uh, by Richard Tonson and Jacob Tonson, the Tonsons eventually becoming uh, one of the great publishing cartels in London um, who tried to monopolize Shakespeare and went to great lengths to keep that profitable monopoly on Shakespeare. This is a little fragile, but you can see the dedicatory epistle in defense of Tate's work. Uh, here, you can see there are some reader's marks, and they are somewhat early. Uh, there's a, a name written on the title page and dated 1817. Um, so someone's reading this play, possibly marking it, marking it up a long time after it was published. Uh, and, and you can see some of the things that were interesting. Here there's a couple of, of uh, marks in the margin. See how close I can get. Uh, I fell upon a new modeling of this tragedy, as I had just before done on the history of King Lear, charmed with the many beauties I discovered in it, I close. which I knew would become the stage. There uh, we go. Nahum Tate is now famous or infamous for adapting King Lear and giving it a happy ending, which Shakespeare's play certainly does not have, uh, although other versions of the Lear myth did have happy endings, so we shouldn't totally condemn uh, Tate for doing this. But that's why he's famous now. The Richard II, to my mind, is maybe uh, more interesting. A couple of other interesting things here. Uh, this is something that on occasion also happens earlier in the 17th century, printing the songs separate from the place in the play where they are supposed to be performed. So we have a song for the third act, a song for the prison scene, and the last act printed completely separately. 
Uh, Tiffany Stern, among others, has written about the ways that plays are patched together from lots of different kinds of, of material and that songs are one of those kind of detachable parts that may or may not be printed with a play. And this just makes it quite clear and obvious that it's a separate section. Uh, here we have the person's names together with those under which the play was acted. And also, to, this is a little bit down here. As someone who loves catalogs, do the serious book nerdery here. Uh, a little notice, books newly printed for R. Thompson and J. Thompson. Uh, the Spanish Friar, written by Master Dryden, Lucius Junius Brutus, um, a tragedy written by Mr. Lee, The Art of Making Love, or Rules for the Conduct of Ladies and Galleants in Their Amours, price of each one shilling. Uh, I've, I've written a fair amount about these little advertisements and, and catalogs, and this is something that started in the middle of the 17th century. They had some space left over on the, on the page, um, on the, the, the list of the dramatis personae, and so of course you use that extra space to advertise other books that you could buy at the same shop. Books that are exactly the kind of books that someone who bought a play would be interested in. Other plays, obviously, like Dryden uh, and Lee, and the rule for conduct of ladies and gallants in their amours, which people who visited the playhouse and read plays were obviously very much interested in. So this is a cool little book. Mm -hmm. I, I set the camera down, but I can put it back. No, no, no. Anything no. else you want to show about that one? That's all sorts of good book nerd stuff in this in that particular book. So. Okay, well, we have passed the first hour of this live stream. So I just want to check in and say welcome to anyone who is just joining us uh, in different time zones. If you're just starting your lunch break and tuning in, uh, we are answering questions live on air with uh, Professor Adam Hooks from the Department of English here at the University of Iowa. So if you have a question, you can type it into the comment section on the YouTube page or you can tweet at us on Twitter using the hashtag SHXLive, Shakes Live. Uh, and I think we, we have one thread going on on the Tumblr as well. Um, UI Spec Call, U-I-S-P-E-C-C-O-L-L. -L. Um, so Tumblr, Twitter, or type it in the comments on YouTube and uh, we'll answer questions live on the air. Otherwise, we have some interesting editions of Shakespeare's works uh, to show off and discuss uh, live on the air today. And we're doing this uh, because it's Shakespeare's birthday week. And I say Shakespeare's birthday week because we don't actually know when his birthday is. We know when he was baptized, but we don't know exactly the day that he was born on, uh, although it's traditionally celebrated on the 23rd, which just also happens to be the uh, day celebrating the patron saint of England. And isn't that all terribly convenient? Um, I prefer to think of it as Shakespeare's death day because he died on the 23rd of April as well, so. That's fine. We can also honor Shakespeare's death day with the live stream. And this is our second live stream. Uh, so we did the same thing last year. And if you go to the archive of videos, if you go to the collection of videos on the UI Spec Call YouTube channel, uh, which this should be airing from, uh, you can see if you scroll through uh, the arc, the version from last year, um, and you can rewatch all the glory from last year's stream as well. Uh, and after today, this one will also live on um, the UI Spec Call channel. So, if you weren't able to tune in live, if you're watching this later, you know you can feel free to type comments in. Uh, you know we check back periodically, and uh, there's there's a chance to answer questions later as well. So even if you're tuning in later, you should still yeah. type your questions. Some of what we're talking about uh, can be found in short essays on my website, uh, which features a lot of material from Iowa Special Collections, not exclusively, but for the most part. Uh, so you can follow up later on uh, things that you may or may not be curious about. Um, yeah. Let's see here. I'm going to, 
someone meant this is not a question but someone mentioned and I, i've been thinking about this uh in one of my classes this semester about prompt books uh we do have um I'm particularly thinking because I, uh, I'm teaching a, a lot of theater students in my uh, Renaissance drama class this semester, and they're very interested in ways that text fosters performance. Um, and we do have some theatrical documents from, from Shakespeare's time. Um, I've used the costume inventory uh, from the Admiral's Men, from Philip Henslow, from the Henslow Archive, which is online, and you can look at some really high quality digital images with some really helpful essays as well. Um, we have, I think we can, I think on that website, you can also see the plot uh, of a play called The Seven Deadly Sins, which is a document that we've hung backstage at the theater uh, that helped organize the, the performance. And then there are also, um, uh, there's a series published on Shakespearean prompt books of the later 17th century. So you get some copies that have been marked up, printed copies marked up for performance uh, much later. The, the recent, first folio that was found in France. Uh, it seems like that it's possible that, I think it was one of the Henry IV plays, Henry IV, Henry V. Um, it seems like it may have been marked up for a possible performance. Uh, so the, things like that did happen, and we know that uh, some people used play quartos and folios uh, for, for performance. So if, if, if people are thinking about that, that's something I've been thinking about. So. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have a current question here on our YouTube free feed um, that I think is an interesting one. If you had Shakespeare sitting next to you, this comes from Cap Spaulding, 1930. If you had Shakespeare sitting right here, right here, goes to Shakespeare, um, and you could ask him one question, what would that be? one that really bugs you, why he did something, or what he really meant when he wrote something, or something like that. Uh, Your burning question for Shakespeare himself. I have so many that I would like to clear up. Um, obviously, I would do a service to Shakespeareans everywhere and ask him what the heck he meant by the second best bed uh, it mentioned in his will. Mentions his wife once, grants her the second best bed. It seems to be a, a, an afterthought or an interlineation. And goodness gracious, um, has there been critical arguments and industries built up around that phrase over the past several centuries. So I'd ask him that. Um, and then uh, I would want to clear up the related question uh, that people often are concerned with. Uh, which is who is exactly who exactly is that fair youth in the sonnets? Um, actually, I'm not sure. I, 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 second best bed, fine. Fair youth of the sonnets. I'm not. I'm not really interested necessarily. They're poems. <laughs> well, for, fiction, for the, not autobiography. For the for the good of all those who ask, while you have his ear, while you have the bard's ear. For the good yeah, of those who want it, exactly. you would For ask. The good of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, I well, I, uh, speaking absolutely personally, because I spend uh, a lot of time writing about and thinking about uh, the printer, the first printer. We talked about the the Kelmscott Press edition of the poems a bit earlier. Uh, the first printer of Venus and Adonis and Lucrece was Richard Field. Um, one of my very favorites, one very special to me since that was the first part of um, uh, my dissertation that I, that I wrote in graduate school on Richard Field. And I continue to think about and write about him an awfully lot. Uh, Richard Field happened to come from a little town called Stratford-upon-Avon and was about two and a half years older than Shakespeare. So isn't that interesting that the first thing printed by Shakespeare was printed by someone who comes from Stratford, and there was a, uh, a similar critical industry that's been built up around that particular connection that underlies so much uh, uh, of our scholarship, both biographical, critical, and historical. So I would want to ask Bill uh, about his relationship or lack thereof to one Master Richard Field of Stratford-on-Avon, just for my own personal 
not that it not that it necessarily matters. I'm more interested in the narratives that people tell uh, about these possible connections. But I might ask him and then just keep that one to myself. Maybe. Well, we do have more questions on the YouTube feed from um, from Rachel Stevenson, but it's following up on something we said maybe 15 minutes ago, and I'm not sure if you can pick up the thread again. Um, she asks, were those adaptations popular, and or do people prefer the Shakespearean originals still? First of all, hi, Rachel. Uh, Rachel has looked at uh, a, a lot of the books. Uh, I found a lot of the books that you can see on my website and that I use in my teaching all the time. Um, the, uh, the the late seventeenth century adaptations are are really interesting for a variety of uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and again, I'll use the example that I've been thinking the most about, which is King Lear, which is that when Tate uh, first wrote his um, adaptation of, of Lear, the Shakespearean version kind of disappeared from the stage for, for a very long time. And so people engaged in a theater, at the very least, with Lear through Tate's Lear. And, and examples can be multiplied uh, as well. Um, some of the other, let's see, the Richard II in particular, uh, that is difficult to say. Um, I don't, I don't know. How about that? It's a good word for a Shakespearean and a bibliographer uh, <laughs> to be aware of. Um, the I do know who who would know um, scholars who work mainly on the late seventeenth and early eighteenth century theater, and you have, you also have to think about this um, uh, both as a matter of popularity in print versus popularity or lack thereof in the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, so for a play like his adaptation of Richard II, it's obviously prohibited in, in the theater. Um, you could do a, a quick search of the ESTC to see if there were any reprints of the Richard II, but, um, or you could ask someone uh, who actually knows about this. Uh, Emma DePledge works on late 17th century Shakespeare adaptations, particularly in the, the period of the exclusion crisis. Uh, so you can look up uh, one of her articles published in PQ, Philological Quarterly, published out of the University of Iowa English Department, in fact, to answer that more thoroughly than, than I can, possibly. We've got one here. Well, one, we got a comment on our Twitter that um, Baby and I are watching the broadcast, Never Too Young for Shakespeare. Well, hi, Jillian. Hello to Jillian. Uh, hope you're enjoying the broadcast. Um, and then we've got another question that came in in our Shakes Live uh, hashtag. So just a reminder, if you're tuning in, uh, you can ask your questions either on the YouTube page or on Twitter using the hashtag SHX Live, Shakes Live. Um, so I, wanna, I just want to say, interject something really quickly about watching this uh, with your baby. Uh, and that's um, uh, something that I, I can't tell the, the, the full story because I'm still kind of digging around and, and thinking about it, but uh, the University of Iowa was one of the pioneers of, of uh, like, dis I don't know exactly what to call it, but like distance learning or using media, uh, um, like the radio, um, to, te to teach courses over, over the radio, um, kind of like a MOOC, but way, be way before that. Uh, or e e extension learning, uh, something like that. And there was, back in the um, maybe 1970s, I can't remember exactly, a Shakespeare course taught at the University of Iowa over the radio, uh, and I've seen some materials from, from that course. Um, my my uh, predecessor in the English department, uh, the Shakespearean Miriam Gilbert, assembled a group of radio actors and they would perform scenes from the plays along with some recorded lectures, uh, from uh, another professor, um, and there are instructions about what to do when the radio broadcast comes on because you can't miss it because it's over the radio. And and the, you're instructed to go to like a quiet place in your house and make sure that the children are taken care of so that the children don't bother you while you're listening to your Shakespeare lecture. There's a lot more I can say about that. <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and just say times have changed a little. Yeah. Well, and it is interesting then that we're following up on a long Iowa tradition of broadcasting about Shakespeare, though we don't have any performers. 
next year. Next year. Look forward to it. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> uh oh, now we're making promises we may not be able to keep. We'll see what we can do. Uh, we do have another question coming in on Twitter with the hashtag Shakes Live. Um, have you come across any contemporary annotations that have influenced your thinking about a Shakespeare text? Yes. Um, Best answer. I'm going to, well, I'll, I'll say a couple of different things. And one is that um, annotation of playbooks um, and annotation of, of like the play portos and of uh, the first folio. It is, it is often and rightly said that the, the texts that we're often most interested in, you know, English literary texts, were not marked up um, nearly as often as other kinds of texts, religious texts, um, historical, scientific texts, uh, editions of the classics, uh, school books in particular. Uh, readers were trained uh, to read and to mark up their books. Um, this is what this is. Th these are pedagogical practices I continue to use in my own classes where I teach my students to read like Renaissance readers uh, and to mark up their books. But people also did mark up plays uh, as well or, or um, uh, other, other literary works. Sometimes those marks are totally unrelated to the text, but sometimes they make really interesting, if brief, comments. Uh, and people who have done a kind of examination of a large collection of play quartos, and I'll bring up uh, Claire Bourne at the Folger, uh, once more, who's doing a, a survey of, of the playbooks, mostly focusing on typography, but obviously coming across some really interesting uh, annotations as well, uh, including some that are rather, um, that, that, that do make comments uh, on the plays and make qualitative and aesthetic judgments that are not necessarily positive. Uh, I'll say that. Um, the, I'm going to answer the, the the question about annotations that have changed the way that, that I think about the plays in, in two different ways. Uh, one is uh, the, the practice of inserting commonplace markers in play quartos. And this is something that uh, other folks have written about. I've written about in part, um, part of the, the wider commonplacing tradition in the period with all sorts of interesting implications. And when I first learned about that, uh, that became really a focus of, of part of my scholarship. And this is something that some, some plays were printed with printed commonplace markers, which means that they're pre-read and pre-digested in a certain way. Like, pay attention to this, copy this down in your own notebook. Uh, and then readers also added their own uh, as well. Uh, I just started teaching Webster's great play, Duchess of Malfi, in my drama class, which is filled with these little sententious statements uh, with the with the quote marks around them. And it, it kind of forces you to read the play in a very different way um, so that you're not focusing on character development or, or plot, but you're focusing on uh, little um, statements of, of wisdom or, or things that you find attractive one way or another, uh, sententious or just aesthetically pleasing uh, that you can pick out for yourself. So that, that is, I mean, when I, when I first learned about that, that totally changed how I thought about engaging with uh, Shakespeare, with other early texts. It's totally changed the way that I teach. It's the fundamental thing that I, that I teach now. So uh, that's not any individual notation, but it's, a, it's kind of a set or a class of uh, notations. Um, the, other, the other thing I would say is that I, um, early in my graduate training when I was Oh, in those early days, just learning about the first folio for the first time. Oh, I wish I could go back. Uh, um, it was it was very interesting to see some of the surveys of the Folgers collection of folios and the things that people did to their books that have nothing to do with Shakespeare at all. Um, image, I've seen images of uh, like rust marks. Um, in books where a set of scissors had been left or a pair of eyeglasses had been left in the Shakespeare folio for so long um, that it started to eat through the page. Um, and so getting a, like getting a sense of these books as material artifacts with very interesting and complicated lives, but, but not for the reasons that we often 
pay attention to these books. Uh, I was just in a workshop at the Shakespeare Association of America conference on the first folio, on reading the first folio and teaching with it both in the 17th century and now. And it was organized in part by a professor from Meisei University in Japan, which owns the uh, most heavily annotated copy of the first folio in existence. And it was really interesting to see how people had um, introduced their students to it. Just like, this is the way that one contemporary reader um, that may or may not be representative engaged uh, with, uh, with some of the plays. And so that, that can be very useful as well. Um, yeah. So thank you, Shannon Supple, for your question. I hope that <laughs> I hope that answer was satisfactory. Type another question if you think of something else. Um, for those tuning in, uh, we're answering questions live with Professor Adam Hooks uh, in honor of Shakespeare's birthday, death day week. Um, you can use the hashtag ShakesLive, S-H-X-L-I-V-E. You can type them into the YouTube channel where the speed is is appearing. Um, ask us, otherwise we've got some interesting additions on hand to show. I do have one collection that I could pull out. Yeah. For the record, I really love it when librarians get that look on their face <laughs> like, I have something to show you because it's always fantastic. <laughs> well, I pulled this one out because so some of you tuning in um, may already know of our Tumblr for the University of Iowa Special Collections. Um, and uh, we, you know, feature interesting items from the collection every day. And uh, one of the things I think is, is interesting is how, you know, we love everything we put up. You know, and some things that we put online, a few people interact with, they like it, they reblog it, um, and sometimes things just spread like wildfire. And we don't always have a way to anticipate what the reaction is going to be. It often comes as a complete surprise. Um, but there are some blockbuster topics that are more likely to catch fire than others. Um, Alice in Wonderland. Um, you know, uh, 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 Shakespeare, of course, is one of those topics where, depending on what it is, it can really catch fire. And so I brought out this set, which I'm keeping deliberately out of view. I will reveal in just a moment. Um, but it's a set of, of Shakespeare's works. And I think that's interesting because so many of the books that we've featured so far, we've featured, you know, individual items, individual plays, you know, sources. But so often a, a way that people interact with Shakespeare is an entire set, you know, and we certainly have many of those in the collection. Often they are gigantic. I don't know how we get them to this room, you know, to show off an entire set. We have to stack up an entire library behind us, you know, when it's a complete set and every volume is this big and there's an individual volume for every work of Shakespeare, you know, but that's that's a way that people like to possess Shakespeare, to have it, to have all of it. Um, the, um, the, uh, the, the week that I needed to look at every 18th century edition of Shakespeare's works that we have in the collection in order to see what order the plays were printed in, which requires every single volume of many, many different editions. They just put me at a desk back in the stacks because otherwise it would break the librarians' backs. They're so big and there's so many of them, you know, and across the ages, there is a real attraction to owning all of it. Um, and so this is a, a handy way to own all of Shakespeare's works. So I, uh, I'll try to hold this still. Yeah, the box is a little fragile, so we'll have to be careful um, opening the lid of the box in particular. So we'll stack up some support behind it. But what you can see in this box is an entire set of Shakespeare's works. You can fit, you know, you can carry around. It's very light. Uh, they're just the size to tuck in your pocket and have with you. Um, if you want to have Romeo and Juliet tucked in your in your coat pocket right next to your heart, you are you are ready to go. Um, I see these online with some frequency being sold in twos and threes, you know, with the set broken up. But here you have the complete works of Shakespeare, miniaturized and ready to tuck away in your pocket to peruse whenever you need to, to pull it out when you're waiting for the bus. Um, 
and you can have Macbeth with you. Or you can have, this is amazing, a single volume with the comedy of errors and Venus and Adonis, which is not a conjunction that is often made <laughs> by scholars. Carefully edited and compared with the best texts. Interesting. So there's definitely an appeal of miniature mm -hmm. books. I mean, people universally just love small things. Published by the Nick Bacher Leather and Novelty Company. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, this is a way to have it, to have all of it, to have it in a size that's reasonable for interacting with. And they're small, but they're still incredibly legible. Um, they're just really perfectly sized. If they were any smaller, you wouldn't be able to read the text. Um, but they do manage to make it in a really legible size. Um, this is part of our miniature book collection, though, with a cutoff of a technical cutoff of three inches. I think some of these would be just beyond a technical definition of being a miniature book. Well, this is interesting as well because it's not a complete. Is it? It's not quite a complete set of everything. No, um, it, it does not appear to be. We have no Lucrece. That's have, true. We have no Sonnets. We have no Pericles. So it is quite a few, but not complete. And one Tempest, Tempest that seems to have been handled more than the others, as it's the only one where the, where the name is missing. Yeah, in fact, it looks slightly, slightly more scuffed than the others. But just slightly. Mm -hmm. Seriously, yeah. <laughs> just, uh... Do you have any other thoughts on complete sets? I I have all sorts of thoughts about complete sets. Um, I set this one up to be a complete set, and then it turns out it isn't. But I will post the link to that Tumblr post that features this set, um, and you can see and maybe hypothesize along with us why it is that that one went everywhere. It did perform so well that everybody wanted to reblog and interact with this post about the tiny miniature versions. Tiny pocket Shakespeare's. Mm -hmm. Now you can have Shakespeare on your iPhone, so uh, similar thing. Yeah, no, the, the idea of a complete Shakespeare is... Uh, uh, a long-standing problem on what co actually constitutes uh, Shakespeare or a, a complete Shakespeare. There's the um, uh, the first folio, which excludes some plays that were attributed to him in print, and also excludes all of the non-dramatic poems. The third folio, which adds seven plays, including Pericles, that have had some print attribution to Shakespeare, even though we don't include most of those plays in the canon uh, anymore. So the, the, we tend to define, there are different ways to define the canon in Shakespeare uh, as something that he actually wrote or wrote part of, uh, or something that was simply attributed to him um, in print or, or attributed to him in a reference uh, one way or another. And that canon uh, kept shifting uh, from the moment that his works first reached print. Um, 18th century editions made different decisions. Um, there, there is a group of plays that have come to be known as the Apocrypha, uh, which signal, you know, signals Shakespeare's scriptural status as a, a sacred entity. Uh, and people continue to write about um, the apocryphal plays. Uh, in fact, uh, Pete Kerwin has a brand new book on Shakespeare and the idea of the Apocrypha. And so that would be a great place to go uh, to to find out more uh, about the, the problems in identifying complete works. So I, I mentioned earlier the, the poems published in the, uh, in the 18th century never being integrated into an edition of the complete works until late in the 18th century. But that's not actually true from a different perspective because, say, the Tonson cartel only published the complete plays, uh, but then other publishers uh, would publish uh, concurrently 
companion volumes that did include uh, the non-dramatic poems that were clearly designed uh, to be you know, purchased alongside or to complete a, a Shakespeare set. Uh, and we have uh, some copies of those, and that starts uh, in 1709 and 1710 with uh, additional volumes to Rose Shakespeare. So that's a long, um, a very long um, history of identifying complete or incomplete Shakespeare's uh, in that sense. And in fact, I, we, another one of the books that we have here uh, totally relates to this. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just go grab it. Beautiful library binding. Oh, the most beautiful binding in the collection. Sturdy. And sturdy and protective. Uh, there were there were some questions and some interest in, in uh, Shakespeare forgeries, and so this is this is both uh, a way to think about complete Shakespeare uh, and also Shakespeare forgeries, because of course one of the things to do to remedy a uh, perceived gap in the Shakespeare canon is to simply find or find uh, a Shakespeare play uh, that helps fill that particular gap. So this gorgeous State University of Iowa. 20th century binding that has held up remarkably well over the that years. has held up remarkably mm -hmm. well um, one of the, the the interesting thing here and this was in the news again recently uh, because this particular volume includes a copy of double falsehood I'll just hold it up just for a second there because this is rather sturdy this is um, I think it was 1767 edition of Double Falsehood, uh, not a first edition, but an edition nonetheless. Uh, uh, Double Falsehood was a play that was presented early in the 18th century by the Shakespeare scholar and uh, aspiring dramatist Louis Theobald as a version of a lost Shakespeare play. Um, he claimed to have access to manuscripts of a Shakespeare play called Cardinio, uh, and he adapted it in the play that he called Double Falsehood or The Distressed Lovers. And this has gotten a lot of attention uh, over the years and, and a lot of renewed attention recently as well, because there is some documentary evidence that there actually existed a play called Cardeno or Cardeno in the 17th century. Uh, one that was attributed to Shakespeare and to his collaborator, John Fletcher, who was also his successor um, as the lead playwright in his theatrical company. Uh, I, I won't go into all the details uh, of the material evidence for that because that's been well covered uh, by others. Um, the, it, it was not a successful play when Theobald presented it, and he was accused of simply forging the play uh, because it, Theobald was an editor of Shakespeare and, oh yes, an editor of John Fletcher as well. And so he was intimately acquainted with their work, which would make him either an ideal uh, scholar and reviser or an ideal forger uh, as well. Um, my, uh, my interest is not to, in establishing the presence or lack thereof of a play like this in the 17th century. Um, my interest is in the the desire that people have to find Shakespeare in this play. Um, some, uh, in fact, more than one prominent Shakespeare scholar has written their own version of this play. So again, if you can't find it, just write it. Uh, versions of this have, have been performed recently. Um, people have done uh, linguistic and stylistic analysis on the play to try to see if they can salvage any fragments or remnants uh, or fossils of Shakespearean or Fletcherian verse in the play that if, if it was genuine and Theobald did just adapt it, uh, maybe we can still identify, like maybe there's some Shakespeare still buried there. Uh, and so again, I think the desire to find that uh, is more interesting than uh, the, the methods used to attempt to find that in a lot of different ways. Um, let's see. The, the other, a few, few other interesting things here. 
Um, my interest in this particular volume, because this is a later printing uh, of Double Falsehood, uh, well, first of all, I'm just like in, 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 in praise of, you know, hashtag Team Theobald, not Team Tybald. Um, Theobald, I'm going to call him Theobald. We don't know exactly how his name would have been pronounced, but uh, he and Alexander Pope, shall we say, didn't get along very well. And he was satirized uh, in Pope's Dunciad uh, as Tybald, which is either evidence of the way his name was pronounced or an insult, because that's not the way his name was pronounced. But uh, he, he was one of the very first um, kind of recognizably modern editors of Shakespeare who aimed at a historical evidence in order to explain some of his decisions rather than a, a more aesthetic or dramatic approach, which is Kind of what Pope represents. Um, the, the interesting thing is that his engagement with this particular lost Shakespeare play is, is interesting because the idea of a genuine Shakespeare in the 18th century was very different than what we would think of as genuine Shakespeare. Again, the, to go back to the Kelmscott poems we looked at uh, an hour ago, the idea that the original spelling gives us access to Shakespeare, which is in some sense true, but in some sense not true as well because it's still filtered um, through the printing house and through other media as well. But the idea of a genuine Shakespeare was very different. A genuine Shakespeare was one that appealed to 18th century uh, readers, audiences, scholars, uh, etc. But, but the, the, the real interest from, from my perspective here is that you can see from the spine, it does not say double falsehood. And in fact, this volume uh, is, contains three separate plays, including the first one, which is how this book is cataloged, uh, El Zuma, a tragedy. Uh, and the third play is the massacre at St. Bartolomeo. I'm already getting responses on Twitter to me insulting library buckram bindings. It's not what I meant. I swear, they're really fantastic and they do their job so well. Uh, since I live primarily in the world of assisting scholars and students with, uh, I mean, we have the Center for the Book here, so we're so often looking at how more contemporary bindings were made. You know, it's really exciting for us when we come across something more contemporary, but of course we really need library buckram bindings and they're fantastic and there's so many people who dedicate their lives to making them, to make the library books last. Um, no hate for the library binding intended. It's just really nice to see a contemporary binding as well. or. Or, or even a rebind through time because it, it gives us information about the text itself, but also about how it was used through time, as the library binding does too. A, a, abrasion resistant, very durable, very useful. It mm -hmm. still doesn't mean it's attractive. I'll, I'll be willing to go out on. <laughs> on, on I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll take the heat on this one, Colleen. Um, I know I, uh, I did. Uh, uh, I have on occasion had mock arguments, maybe even real arguments. It's sometimes hard to tell about bindings. Some bindings are more historical than others. All bindings are historical. Some are just better at being historical than others, perhaps. Some we, in the place that where we are right now, have particular contexts for viewing them as more or less valuable mm -hmm. as each of them was viewed differently through time. Exactly. The, well, I, the, um, this actually raises a, a good question because we have several... I'm glad we could segue. <laughs> no, uh, I'm, willing, you know, I'm willing to stick my, my neck out a little further, maybe. Um, so we have uh, several, um, in fact, we, have a, we don't have them on the cart with us right now, but we have uh, a collection of like three or four volumes of uh, plays that have been bound together, uh, plays that were not published together, so technically a, a Samuel band, just like this volume is, like three mid 18th century plays that at some point were bound together, and then apparently at some point rebound together in this library binding. I can't imagine that they would have taken three separate uh, plays and, and bound them together in this 20th century library binding uh, you can tell because the, the pages have uh, all been trimmed uniformly. 
uh, it's, a, it's just an in, it's, it's an interesting preservation decision that it, that in the history of libraries has not always been made is to keep plays bound together rather than ripping them apart into single editions. This is something that Jeff Knight has written about uh, as far as Renaissance literature um, uh, and, and binding practices, uh, particularly for Shakespeare, uh, collections of plays have often been torn apart um, and then rebound kind of uniformly in uh, red or green Morocco bindings, uh, which to, to my mind are rather boring uh, when they're collected all together. Uh, but that tells you something about the ways that these artifacts were valued in, uh, at a certain moment in history, or, or maybe not valued as enough mm -hmm. to, to tear apart. So that Alzuma, a tragedy, uh, as performed at the Theater Royal in Covent Garden, that was clearly not uh, as attractive mm -hmm. as a Shakespeare play that would have been performed at, at Covent Garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another com comment coming in from our Twitter, Twitter feed is, um, when you see a binding like this, it can often indicate a lot of trimming has happened, and that often means marginalia is trimmed off. And so even if you take a look at the title page on this one, you can see, well, maybe you can if I get close enough, and it settles and focuses, Hmm, maybe we're not going to get that, but there's some pencil marks right up here that are cut right in half. Um, and that that is a problem. That's why we'd be happy to see something that had been on it a bit longer, um, because it would be far more likely that it had not been trimmed and there'll just be more information there that wasn't cut off. You know, earlier in the, in the stream, in the feed today, we talked about annotations. Um, and the more that a book is trimmed as it's rebound again and again through time, um, it gets a little smaller and a little smaller. Um, and that marginalia was not valued universally through time the way that it is now, um, when we could see the way that different readers interacted with the book. Um, and it's often just trimmed off um, all of it or trimmed in half. Um, it just, it, wasn't something that they were interested in at the time. And so a lot of that information can be lost as a book is bound and rebound again and again. Grab this. Since we're talking about this, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, one of my favorite things in the collection, and I just this moment tweeted out a link uh, to an essay or a post about this on my own website. Uh, we have. Um, some, I can't remember if they're late 17th century or maybe uh, early 18th century, there are three, vo three volumes, like the, the one that's been rebound here. Um, and of course, this was an, an, uh, a very, very common practice, uh, and scholars are increasingly paying attention to this. Because play quartos uh, were easily identifiable as plays, they're distinct material commodities in a lot of different ways that are visible um, and distinctive, and because they're sold unbound, uh, as pamphlets, maybe uh, maybe unbound or, or simply stab stitched, uh, they could be. They were collected and then bound together once you had collected enough to make a substantial enough volume to make it worth the while um, to do that. And so here we have this substantial collection that's labeled on the spine as comedies, which is in fact a, a collection of 18th century plays that have been bound together. In what looks to be a contemporary or close contemporary binding, uh, and it also includes uh, a much later bibliographer who has given us a list of the of the table of contents. There are ten plays, uh, mostly Congreve plays, but with a, a few others thrown in as well. Kali uh, Sibber and Wickerly and Lee. Um, a couple of others, an Etheridge play uh, to kick everything off. Uh, and I, I really like to show this to my students because this is the, the closest example that we have in the collection to a practice this, that was extremely common um, throughout the period, uh, including in Shakespeare's time. Uh, the other thing I like to show my students is that the first play is called Love in a Tub. Uh, Etheridge play from the 1690s that 
always gets a snicker or two from some from some of my students. But it's a it's a it's a good way because we often focus um, and for good reasons on large collected works editions, um, the Shakespeare folio, the Johnson folio. Um, but as scholars uh, have talked about increasingly recently, and as I've been harping on for a while now, even those collected editions are kind of precarious in a lot of different ways uh, and are not necessarily integral or integrated in the ways that we often think of them. It's something that they have to work very hard at materially and rhetorically to present as something that is complete um, and showing um, students volumes that have been collected by customers or, or collectors and, and bound together on their own, of their own accord, uh, is something that really helps bring that out. Should we show yeah, a little bit of this a, one? Let's, let's show this one. Get a little bit closer. Here's the first, the, the first opening with our Etheridge play. Uh, in a much later list over here. Um, let's see if we can get it to focus on that. Uh, some some contemporaries, and we, we do have uh, evidence of this, would, would make their own tables of contents in handwriting. That was a, I don't know, if, if I say it was a not uncommon thing, I think I, I would be safe in doing that. But someone uh, much later has come in and, and done something very similar here. The, the usefulness, especially for students, just to get a glance, is that the, the bibliographer or bookseller has listed the dates and the editions so it's the seventh edition of the old bachelor, the second edition of Way of the World, uh, and given the dates, one sixteen ninety seven, but otherwise clustering around seventeen o four to seventeen o nine. So these were collected, for the most part, within uh, about a decade, and probably bound together not long thereafter. And you can see the extensive provenance history from the number of book plates um, here including one from 1885, uh, one from a public library, and for real book nerds out there, one from the, Cam the famous Cambridge bibliographer, A.N.L. Munby, uh, with a nice uh, little picture of King's College, Cambridge there. Um, I wrote this in the post online as well, but that was a real find, uh, I have to say. And how this book ended up in Iowa I have no idea, but I would really like to know. We'll work on it. If books could speak, right? Instead of Shakespeare. <laughs> well, that's our other video series that we're working on. If this books is, could talk. So let's see. The Public Library, who presented by Miss Dunn. And if you take a look back in the front cover, you can see here uh, a book plate of Joseph Philip Dunn from 1885. Uh, so it passed from this family into the public library collection and then withdrawn at a certain point and um, picked up by someone else. I haven't identified this. Well, this is, um, in fact, this is a done plate as well because it has the date 1885. Yeah, and a you D. You see JD there. And then here on this one it says lot 8. So it was definitely in an auction at some point. All sorts of good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, this little collection of comedies. Well, we've been asked on our YouTube uh, if you would like to comment, because I know it's state the question and then move on. Don has asked us, in addition to the wonderful individual volumes that you're sharing us with us, what would you describe as the larger glories of the UI special collections that might draw researchers to a, for a visit specifically with regards to Shakespeare? Um, I mean, I think uh, the volume that sees the most use um, and that's pulled out for classes and that's pulled out by researchers, by readers stopping by our reading room the most would be Shakespeare's second folio. Um, you know, it has a historic significance um, that brings people almost like a pilgrimage um, to come and see it since we exactly have like one here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, that's obviously the the draw in, in classes, like I, I pull, it up every, pull it out every time as well, in classes, um, other classes, whether they're Shakespeare classes or not, would generally take a look at that volume. Um, 
it, it's, I would say, if you're thinking about researchers visiting, I mean, it's really interesting that there's so much attention on the first folio. There's a, a kind of a distinct lack of attention on some of the other 17th century folios. Uh, there is no proper census of the second folio, for, for example. Uh, and there's just not as much scholarship uh, on the second folio uh, as well. Um, so it's less an object of research than uh, an, a, a kind of fetishized object or a, something you would go, go on a pilgrimage uh, to, to see. Um, I, I would say, I would answer the, Don's question uh, in a couple of different ways. Um, one is that lots of the, the things that I find valuable and interesting and use in my teaching um, as far as Shakespeare can be found in the posts on my website and I also keep um, an occasionally updated Zotero list of books that I often use in my Shakespeare classes so most of the things we've seen here are on that list and I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm always happy to, to share that link uh, as well. For, if you're thinking of larger bodies of, um, of, uh, of what we have here, um, we have an excellent teaching collection we have a number of 18th century editions of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. We also have a lot of Shakespeare forgeries. We have a large collection of Ireland forgeries. Uh, and I've done some work on that, and I always show my classes, but uh, I unfortunately haven't had the time yet to fully explore. But we have a pretty substantial collection of materials, uh, primary materials related to that. And I think that uh, forgeries are, are very interesting because they're often analyzed only through the lens of, of Shakespeare or the um, deification of, of Shakespeare or the through that kind of the, the cultural or financial value of Shakespeare it's kind of interesting that there's been less of a focus uh, from like a book historical angle um, on some of these forgeries so I, I think that that is that there's something valuable uh, there and because they were so well known and, and notorious, uh, it's kind of like uh, a lot of libraries have materials like this. So, like the, the, in my classes, I do lots of lessons about early modern Bibles. Why? Because we have tons of early modern Bibles. Why? Because there were tons of early modern Bibles, uh, and because of that, uh, even a collection like ours that had no coordinating strategy to to acquire them ended up with a large collection of them. Um, mm -hmm in all sizes, formats, uh, the different versions, some pristine, some marked up and, and heavily used. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are, those should draw uh, people more, I think. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we're able to really do with our collection here is that, especially if you're teaching about Shakespeare, you know, which we do here as a university, there's use for actual printed Shakespeare texts um, but also pairing that with contemporaries, pairing that with, you know, other plays from the time, other sonnets from the time, you know, and showing uh, publication history of how different types of things were published at the time. So having those even completely unknown to us now, texts that were contemporaries can do bring out a lot in the classroom. Um, and then yeah, so so all these contextual materials, other types of materials end up being some of our most valuable Shakespeare materials um, for teaching about Shakespeare here at the university. We also have a really nice fine press collection. I mentioned that mm -hmm. um, like an hour and 45 minutes ago. <laughs> uh, and you know, books that were collected for the fine press collection, not because of mm -hmm. a connection to Shakespeare, but Shakespeare is something that often gets printed, um, plays mm -hmm. and poems. And so we have a, a really nice collection yeah. uh, there as well. And we, we also just have a lot of material that I don't know about yet. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I just call up things for a class session that I've never seen. Uh, I encourage my students to go find things that I haven't shown them in a, in a class session. Uh, and that's how we find out about, mm -hmm. uh, about things. Yeah, and depending on what someone's goal is, you know, for, for our visitors to the reading room, some of the things that may be most impressive are 20th century editions where they've really explored how to artistically interpret Shakespeare with the illustrations. Um, you know, Classics Illustrated can be the most impressive uh, to some of our students. 
you know, the children's very odd children's Shakespeare with the baby cherubs acting creepy, out the uh, Nesbitt, children's Shakespeare books. early 20th century, you know, or, or Shakespeare as interpreted for children, especially in the 19th century, um, can be a really interesting course of study. And then it's not something you'd, you know, say, well, this is the oldest edition of Shakespeare we have, but the one that can be most impressive to someone, it can be interesting illustrations or a way of interpreting it that they just never would have thought of. And you see that a lot more in the 19th and 20th century editions. Um, so yeah, I think that the, the breadth um, is really something that we have to offer here at Special Collections, uh, which you'll be able to see more and more. We're coming up into just the last five minutes of our live stream. So I do want to mention that uh, the Shakespeare's first folios uh, will be touring in 2016 um, and visiting every state in the country. And the University of Iowa applied um, to the Folger Shakespeare Library. And, uh, and I promised to be nice to it. <laughs> you will not be near it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, we're having a, we're getting a little punchy here in the last five minutes. Uh, it will be coming here in 2016, um, in the fall. Um, and along with it, well, our brand new exhibition space in the library will be open and we will be featuring an exhibition of Shakespeare related materials from special collections uh, to give a, a context to the first folio as it, as it arrives. So I know that's more than a year away, um, but do look forward to it. We'll have one more live stream before then for sure um, to give some more updates about how that's going as it gets closer to the event. Um, but if you put fall 2016 in your mind, that's when you'll be able to really see you know, a, a showcase of the Shakespeare related materials that we have here in special collections. So look forward to it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this for a whole bunch of different reasons, because it's a, a chance to do um, on, a, on a larger scale what we're trying to do here, which is to just make some of the materials that we have accessible and, and hopefully in doing so introduce people to a slightly different way of thinking about Shakespeare than they would otherwise. Uh, I mean that not just bibliographically or from the view of special collections, but in all sorts of, of different ways. And uh, I'm hoping to do over the, the next, the course of the next year in my classes, again, a, a, an organized version of what I always do in my classes, which is to attempt to foster a sense of shared discovery, um, where uh, even if we're looking at materials that I've seen a number of times before, students always find something um, that I never noticed uh, of interest, and that, that happened just a, you know, a couple of weeks ago, for, for example. Um, but but over the next year, using my courses as a chance to dig even deeper into the special collections than we have so far, uh, drawing on the students' own interests, their own research projects, which of course are not my interests in my research projects, which means that we get a much wider range. Uh, and so in doing that, I think we're, we'll, uh, we'll have a really exciting, uh, outstanding uh, collection of materials available that think about Shakespeare in a lot of different ways. Um, even just the handful of books that we've taken a look at today accomplish that to a, to a certain degree. Uh, so it makes you kind of defamiliarizes Shakespeare, teaches you something new, um, and in the process teaches you something new about things that have nothing to do with Shakespeare, about cultural history, about readership, um, mm -hmm. uh, about the ways that we choose to value particular objects or concepts uh, over others. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, final remarks then. Uh, from me, it's just, uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this live stream. Um, I know that we have. Uh, we'll be back again next year, I'm sure. Of course. OK. Just checking. He's stuck now. Once you, once, you, <laughs> once you get me started talking about Shakespeare and or old books, I tend not to shut up until I lose my voice. <laughs> uh, and I mean that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so this is something that I really enjoy. I enjoy finding new things, and so it will be fun to uh, spend the next year coming up with even more fun examples mm -hmm. uh, to use in this forum. Mm -hmm. So if you like this event, uh, you can check out the recorded version of last year's live stream. Uh, and it would do us a favor if you just click the subscribe button and uh, on this YouTube channel, and that will give you updates whenever we have new videos on this channel. Um, and do let us know if there's something that you want to see on this channel. We'll do everything we can to make it happen. So if you want more of this type of live event or more of some other type of video, just let us know. Uh, you can type it in the comments or just uh, drop us a line on Twitter. Yeah. 
Any other final remarks? Exeunt. All right. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, tune in next year.